Welcome to the Green Goddess Podcast. I'm your host, Tara Rose. On this show, we explore entheogens and the evolution of consciousness. Today, I'm going to share with you a really exciting sneak peek from my brand new book, Trust the Flow, Awakening with Combo, Cannabis, and Ayahuasca. This book is a memoir. It's about my journey, my spiritual journey of going through shamanic initiations, discovering who I truly am and what my higher purpose really is. And I discovered that through working with the entheogens. This book also goes very deep into um, my personal adventure, moving from being an urban person living in the city of Portland, Oregon, to being a van dweller full time living in the desert of the Southwest in nature off the grid, as I do now. And it's very much about the power of manifestation and positive thinking and prayer, and how you can really survive and live on that. So it's a really profound memoir. It covers a lot of ground. It's really about the last 10 years of my life. And for those of you who have been with me for some time, it is sort of, you could say, the sequel to my very first book, which came out in 2013, called Dandelion Hunter. Dandelion Hunter was about uh, learning about the wild plants and learning to connect with nature in an urban environment for food, medicine, and spirituality. This is really a deep dive into spirituality. I think you're absolutely going to love it and really excited to share with you a preview of a chapter today. The book is available on Audible as an audiobook with myself narrating. You can also get it in paperback or on Kindle as an ebook. So I hope you enjoy it, and I would love it if you do pick up a copy, if you would leave a review. Those help so much. Okay, without further ado, here's your preview of a chapter from my new book, Trust the Flow. Reiki. The poet Rumi wrote, The wound is the place where the light gets in. That was true for me. My introduction to the healing arts came by way of trauma. I had just graduated college and was working at a daily newspaper as a copy editor, a night shift job that got out at midnight and lent itself easily to hitting the party circuit right after because you could stay out late, drink too much, and sleep in as long as you wanted. Well, there was one evening where I really overdid it. I was living with male roommates at the time including one who was the son of a preacher. I had drunk myself into such a stupor that I couldn't move, and this guy saw it as an opportunity to pursue his own gratification. He removed my clothing and attempted to sexually assault me, except that the physical effects of the whiskey he had drank left him unable to follow through. Nonetheless, it was a grave violation of consent and he was well aware of that. He was a dorky, bearded, bespectacled kid who looked like a cross between a lumberjack and an ogre. And there was never any flirtation between us or any indication that I would have been interested in him. We weren't even friends, and we didn't hang out. He knew that what he was doing was wrong. I recall hearing him mutter something about how he was being evil. I was not okay after that incident, in a way I had never been before. It felt like something in the core of my being was gone. I felt like a shell of myself. I felt fundamentally unsafe, especially in places where there were men around. When I went out in public... I felt on the verge of a panic attack. It was hard to function. My spirit was broken. I knew I needed to get help. I suspected that I needed something called a soul retrieval, a special kind of trauma healing that shamans know how to do. Shamanic healing was on my radar because of my studies. At Rutgers University, My undergraduate major had been philosophy with a minor in anthropology, 
And in my anthropology courses, I'd learned about mystical indigenous healing technologies. And I read books about shamanism, which appealed to me very strongly. By searching the internet, I found a woman healer in northern New Jersey who had trained very seriously with Quechua-speaking people high in the Andes of Peru, and so I went to see her. Her treatment space was the finished basement of a nice big house in a rural town. It was dimly lit with just streams of sunshine pouring through the windows, and her space smelled of burned sage and tobacco. I didn't tell her anything about what had happened to me. We simply sat across from each other, cross-legged on the floor in meditation, with our eyes closed. She was silent, but I felt her presence all around me, as if she were floating behind me, beside me, and even above me, instead of sitting across from me. And I felt these pleasant swirls of energy coursing through my body. She told me to stand up, and when I did... My feet felt like they had suddenly become lead, glued to the ground like cement, and energy flowed through me and into the earth like I was a tree. When it was over, I felt great. I felt like myself again, totally normal, restored to factory settings. I felt like nothing bad had ever happened to me, and the memory of that night seemed so faint now that it was easy to forget it ever had. The panicky feeling that something was missing was totally gone, replaced with a sense of inner serenity and wholeness. I was truly amazed at the efficacy of her work and very grateful. This shaman, whose name was Jody, told me that I could become her apprentice if I wanted to do that. She saw something in me, but it was hard for me to believe at that time that I could possibly have the kind of psychic healing gifts that she did. I was very intrigued and honored by her offer, but I didn't feel ready for the journey. I knew I was too wild a partier to be able to commit to anything where I had to show up consistently in the morning and focus at that age. She told me that was okay, and that the call to learn about shamanic healing would return and destiny would kick in, in my thirties. She was right. The year Reiki entered my life was 2012. I was 30. Reiki was the catalyst that sparked the beginning of my spiritual journey. My first encounter with Reiki was serendipitous. I had gone to see a hypnotherapist because I had a terrible case of writer's block that struck very close to a major deadline for my first book, Dandelion Hunter. He told me I was disconnected from my feelings and my inner child and that I needed to do some inner work with the Reiki energy healer and spiritual counselor next door. I was open to that. I arrived at my first Reiki appointment to find a very sweet and ebullient young woman about my age named Jeanette Heater. Jeanette has a bright smile, long curly red hair, and an aura filled with kindness. She was easy to talk to and easy to trust. She worked out of an aqua-colored room with a tasteful wall hanging of the Buddha done in shimmering gold paint. She invited me to recline on her massage table, covered me with a soft blanket, and then guided me to gently close my eyes. She talked about the different colors of energy moving through my body as she hovered above me and channeled the Reiki energy. I did not see the colors myself, Mainly, I experienced Reiki as deeply peaceful, soothing, and relaxing. It seemed subtle, because I'd not yet awakened my intuitive gifts, but I noticed that I did indeed have an easier time writing after seeing Jeanette, and so I came back to see her regularly, both for that reason and because I liked the restorative, stress-relieving properties of the Reiki treatments. I also felt comforted by Jeanette's caring, nurturing presence and her non-judgmental attitude towards anything I shared with her. I'd gotten very little of that sort of thing in my life until then, and so seeing her was like finding an oasis of loving kindness. I got a deeper appreciation for what Reiki could do 
while going through a devastating breakup with my boyfriend at the time. We'd had a passionate on and off relationship with a powerful magnetism between us, and the ending was intensely painful. When I went to see Jeanette for energy work, she blew my mind by using Reiki like a laser beam to vaporize my grief and heartache. I left feeling serene. It was as dramatic a shift as that first shamanic healing I'd received in my early 20s. I had no idea Reiki could do that. I was amazed and dazzled by the efficacy of this mystical technology. And so I asked Jeanette if she'd teach me how to do it. To my delight, she said yes and organized a workshop. I learned that Reiki was developed in early 20th century Japan by a man named Mikao Usui, a mystic and spiritual seeker who had studied Buddhism and Taoism. While some people think Reiki might be traced back to ancient Tibet, and others point to analogs in other places, insofar as it's a codified system of energy healing with a set of specific symbols and a particular frequency, Usui was the originator. Usui encountered Reiki quite unexpectedly. After experiencing significant personal setbacks in his life as a businessman, he was attending a 21-day meditation retreat on Mount Kurama. While there, contemplating his life direction and communing with nature, he stood under a waterfall and was miraculously graced with a new and sudden ability to channel divine healing energy. He discovered this accidentally. He stubbed his toe on the hike back and, while grasping it, felt energy flow out his hands and relieve his pain. He was surprised and delighted. Usui called this gift Rei Ki. Rei meaning universal and divine, and Ki meaning energy. He explored its capabilities and then created a system embedded with kanji-based symbols for teaching it and transmitting it to other people so that he could share it with the world and bring healing to others. One of his students was a Navy doctor named Chujiro Hayashi who ran clinics to help people and developed a set of protocols for physical healing. Dr. Hayashi trained one of his clients, a Hawaiian resident named Hawaiio Takata, and she brought Reiki to America, originally teaching via oral transmission only. Her students wrote down the teachings, and now there are multiple lineages stemming from them, including my own teacher's teachers. At the workshop, Jeanette explained that the ability to transmit the specific frequency of healing energy that is Reiki comes via attunements, which are formal initiations in which a master teacher activates the energy field of a student and passes on spiritual gifts. It's a little bit similar to what the yogic tradition calls Shaktipat, except it has a specific protocol that involves activating each chakra, connecting the student to the frequencies of their own higher self and to the ancestral masters of Reiki. There are multiple levels of initiations in Usui Reiki. The first level enables you to heal yourself. The second gives you the power to be a conduit to heal others. And the third makes you a Reiki master, empowering you to ignite the healing light within others and pass it on. I remember I told Jeanette very sincerely, I'm not going to be a healer. I just want to know how to heal myself. I really believed that too. While many teachers offer all three levels as a weekend workshop, Jeanette teaches them one at a time and goes in depth, insisting that her students take months to let the power of each level sink in and to take time to integrate the shifts that the initiations bring. I'm glad she did. Her Reiki level one training brought me the desire to meditate and it came very easily to me, as if I was remembering something I already knew how to do and was very good at, instead of something unfamiliar and brand new. And I loved channeling the Reiki energy. 
I used it to relieve menstrual cramps, to relax before going to sleep, and to bless situations, loved ones, and the world. It was very empowering. I also had the surprising urge to practice Reiki on my friends, which was something I hadn't expected to want to do. I was completely amazed to discover that as I did, I was getting intuitive messages and images that seemed random to me, but that, when I shared them, turned out to be highly relevant to those I was practicing on. This was exciting and encouraging to me, because I'd never really thought of myself as particularly intuitive before. Now I felt very eager to learn level two. After that level two initiation and training, a door opened for me to become the intuitive healer in residence at a local wellness center that had regular Friday night social events for the community, and I loved it. I got to see Reiki work real miracles. Grieving people found that just one hour of receiving Reiki was enough to take away the pain in their hearts, replacing it with love and peace, just as I'd experienced. There was a woman who came to see me hoping to find relief for her PTSD symptoms, especially insomnia, and after one treatment, she reported a total shift into a greater sense of inner peace and a good night's sleep. The more I did Reiki, the more amazed I was by it. Every time I did a session, amazing things happened. I attracted students and clients effortlessly. People approached me and asked for help in all sorts of places, at the gas station, in cafes, in line at the drugstore, saying that they didn't know why, but they felt drawn to me for some reason. I had to get used to strangers walking up to me and immediately opening up and telling me heavy stories about their lives and what they were going through. As if there were a blinking neon sign over my head that everyone could see except me, saying, Bear your troubles here. I believe it happened because spirit medicines have a way of magnetizing those who need them. For instance, I was at an afternoon potluck garden party when a tall, lanky man in his mid-fifties approached me. He had curly gray hair and kind, smiling eyes. I don't know what it is that you do, he said. But my intuition is telling me that you're very good at it. Maybe you can help me. He stood with his shoulders hunched over, as if his burdens were literally weighing on him, and he was wrapped up in a blanket of shame and hurt. I wondered why. When he came to see me for Reiki, I got a chance to find out. Healing energy flowed out of my hands with a subtle tingle and heat, and I scanned the air above his body with my hands. Healing energy flowed out of my hands with a subtle tingle in heat, and I scanned the air above his body with my hands, looking for places where I felt pressure, heat or cold, or tingling. I found such a place above his abdomen. As I hovered there, he began to weep. I brought him a box of tissues and continued hovering above him. Psychically, the spot on his abdomen began to appear to me like an infected wound, and then a vision came to me. I felt a story arise inside my body, and an internal nudge to open my mouth to share it. I'm seeing that you had a lifetime where you were a Native American man, I told him. I don't know what tribe it was. In this lifetime, you were someone with some amount of authority and status, perhaps a chief or a warrior, something like that. There was a massacre, and in your absence, the women and children were killed. Your family was murdered. You blamed yourself for not defending them. He sobbed and took deep, painful breaths. I felt the ghosts of his slain family standing there around us in the room. I felt they had come to help because they loved him. They forgive you and they want you to forgive yourself, I told him. 
I felt chills and got goosebumps as I said these words. And he sobbed deeply as Reiki flowed through me to help him release himself from blame. After that session, he was a changed man. He even looked different. He stood taller, and there was a lightness in his face. The heaviness he had carried before was gone. He called me several times in the following weeks to express his gratitude. But, of course, it wasn't my doing. Reiki is, by definition, divinely guided energy. Unlike some other forms of energy healing, Reiki requires its practitioners to be conduits more than active facilitators. A skilled Reiki healer embodies non-effort, non-striving, and just being. Doing it well amounts to being a passive witness and a loving presence, while holding great trust in your heart and empowering the ceremony of healing with your intention. The more I let go, the more amazing things became. There was a woman who came to me wanting to heal childhood trauma to do with sexual abuse. I sent Reiki to her past, which, as a quantum technology, Reiki can do. And as the healing light flowed, I received a vision. I saw a queen with a golden crown casting a curse upon the ancestors of my client. The purpose of the curse, I sensed, was to rob them of their innocence and thus their magical power. When I shared this vision with her, she told me that she already knew about it. She said her grandmother had told her that in centuries past, the Queen of England had placed a curse upon her family in Ireland. I sent Reiki healing to the souls of all of her ancestors who had suffered in this way, and prayed to end the curse. And both of us felt an energy shift as divine intervention was granted and peace and love flowed into her body and beyond. On earth, we humans exist in lower densities of vibrational energy than exists in the realm of heaven. Thus, we need intermediaries to act as bridges and step down the high frequency divine healing energy into a physical human body so that others can access it. Initiated healers are like transistors, or electrical transfer stations, in that way. The initiation process that turns a person into a Reiki healer, the attunements, make changes in the nervous system so that we can receive and transmit these frequencies of heavenly light through our physical body. We go through a recalibration process that can be physically exhausting and emotionally challenging. The attunement process often prompts involuntary physical detoxing that occurs when you get connected to greater amounts of light, which to me felt like having a hangover or a mild flu for several days to a week or more. Each person's system does what it needs to do in order to make room. The more attunements a healer receives, the more psychic she becomes, and the more potent the healing energy is that she can hold, radiate, and channel, because a larger bandwidth becomes available. When I became a Reiki master, I discovered that every time I initiated a new healer, I went through the detox process again. And this was a good thing, because... The more heavy energies you release, the clearer a vessel you become. In my case, there was a tremendous amount of material to process and clear as I integrated the attunements. I had a lot of wounds to unravel and much recovery to do, especially when it came time to heal from my childhood, which was a period of great unhappiness and suffering for me. At school, there was bullying. At home, there was abuse. It's not easy to write that word abuse because my parents are also honest, well-intentioned people who did their very best to give me a good life. 
They took me to Disney World. They showed up at my sports games to cheer me on. They celebrated my birthdays with cake and presents. They sent me to summer camp. They bought me a Ford Mustang when I turned 18. And they paid for college. They cared about me and genuinely meant well. Yet, they were also flawed human beings like the rest of us. And I don't know what else to call it when your father hits you in rage and says awful, scarring things about how you're a worthless human being, frequently. Starting when you're a little girl, and continuing until you're a teenager big enough to fight back. And I don't know what else to call it when you come home crying from school, and your mother rolls her eyes at your tears and coldly mocks you, saying, Oh, boo-hoo, and blames you saying you probably deserved it. After all, she resents you for being the reason her husband exposes his monstrous side, and so her heart is callous towards your pain. I stood up to my father all the time. Mom preferred to swallow her words and walk on eggshells around him. She didn't understand why I refused to do the same. She used to say, Do you want to be right, or do you want to be happy? I wanted to be happy, but self-betrayal was too high a price to pay. So I talked back, come what may. And sometimes what came was explosive. For instance, Dad would say, You're supposed to respect me because I'm your father. And I would reply, If you want my respect then you have to act in ways that are worthy of it. He would exclaim, exasperated, You're making me angry. I can't make you feel or do anything, I answered. You're an adult. Act like one. I think it was about nine when I said that. Sometimes... Dad and I just argued bitterly until one of us stormed off, and other times, in my teenage years, Dad chased me around the house yelling at me, and when he caught me, he'd pin my wrist to the wall and spit in my face, saying the meanest and most damaging things he could think of, while dodging the fruitless kicks I tried to launch at him. He was much, much bigger than me. Six feet two and nearly 300 pounds. He mostly found my attempts to fight back rather humorous. If I had not had exercise as an outlet or the deep love of the family dog to comfort me through those difficult times, I think I might have succumbed to the feelings of hopelessness and despair that sometimes left me contemplating a premature exit But I knew that life would get much better when I left for college. It was like a prison sentence with a release date. In the meantime, I coped by disconnecting from my emotions so that I could shut out the pain I felt. I took the dog jogging, went for long walks in nature with my friends, threw myself into my schoolwork, and played on sports teams. And when something bad happened at home, I'd write it down in my diary, and then I'd rip out the pages and throw them away, so I could pretend it had never happened. Abuse is a generational plague, and today I do forgive my parents, because I recognize that they too were suffering its effects, the twisted inheritance of dysfunction. Their ugliest behavior does not define them in my mind, just as I don't define myself by my own worst moments. As my spirit teachers once said to me, the behavior is not the person. Now that I'm grown, dad has since apologized to me with many tears of sincere remorse, saying that he wishes he could go back in time and do things differently. Sometimes he apologized when I was a child too, but that didn't change the damage it did. It took many well-spent years in 12-step rooms and at least a thousand sessions with Jeanette to unravel all of that. My being a sane and healthy adult today is very much a testament to the healing power of spiritual remedies. 
I'm deeply grateful to Reiki and to Jeanette's incredible skills as a psychic counselor. Jeanette was able to perceive the subconscious thoughts, beliefs, and emotions that I'd once kept hidden from myself. And with her gentle assistance, I was able to face them, feel them, and release them. I invested everything I could in my recovery. I pursued it with a burning fire of determination because I understood that to do so was not just to gain peace and wholeness inside myself, but that it was also the very curriculum of my apprenticeship as a healer. There were periods when I was booking three healings a week with Jeanette and other gifted practitioners. As I worked to overcome my childhood trauma, anxiety and depression, self-esteem problems, dysfunctional relationships, and many kinds of neuroses, I knew that many, many people were facing the very same obstacles, and I realized that I was gaining the tools to help them, too. I became fearless about witnessing the depths of other people's suffering as a healer, because I'd already gone there inside myself. I was filled with empathy. As my career as a teacher and healer progressed, I taught Reiki to others, and I led workshops at metaphysical stores on self-love, finding your purpose, and plant spirit medicine. Eventually, I felt a calling to start training apprentices formally, so I organized nine-month group courses. But as I took steps to publicize my work, I began to experience a very intense, overwhelming anxiety. I didn't doubt my abilities, yet I felt major fear about putting myself out there that went way beyond normal jitters. It triggered something irrational within me that reacted as if going more public was somehow very, very dangerous. It was strange because... There wasn't any particular experience that I was aware of in my past that I could connect to these feelings. I did not know the root of it, and I needed to find the root of it in order to dig it up and plant something better. Though I usually worked with Jeanette, this time I felt guided to enlist the services of Laurel Virtues Waters, who's a shamanic healer, Reiki master, author, former professional therapist, and teacher trained by the Four Winds Society. Laurel worked over the phone, as many healers do, and as I do now myself. Laurel did indeed locate the root of my fears, and it was nothing at all like I expected. I will never forget what she told me. After about 10 minutes of melodic drumming that put her into a shamanic trance, Laurel recounted an incredibly detailed vision. You were an African woman, she told me, and very beautiful. And you were a powerful shaman for your tribe. This was unusual, because shamans were usually men, and usually older men, but you were gifted. There was a lot of jealousy, especially among the other women in your tribe. It was said that you had too much power. They started rumors, and it got ugly. Some of those in your tribe who hated you conspired with a neighboring tribe who feared you to attack you. You had large breasts, and they thought this was the source of your power, so they cut them off and left you for dead. They thought that they had killed you and you very nearly died. But a shaman from another tribe, an older man, secretly grabbed you under cover of night and nursed you back to health. He put plants on your chest and salves, and you recovered. You could not go back to your tribe because they'd try to kill you again. So, you were a chest plate and lived in his tribe as a man. You continued your shamanic work there, And meanwhile, you had an affair with the healer's son, a man your age. This man got you pregnant, and once again, this tribe began to fear you. They thought you had too much power because you were a man who was able to become pregnant. When you gave birth, some in the tribe believed your baby was a demon, 
so you had to flee. Both you and your child were at risk of being killed, she said. You went out into the desert and found a herd of elephants. They were matriarchal and telepathic, and they took you in and protected you. You helped them, healing them with herbs, and your child, a son, became very good at finding water. You lived with them, wandering the desert, for twelve years, and then you died. One of the elephants was so heartbroken that it too died on your grave. Your son eventually became part of a village, where he was celebrated for his talents as a dowser. He's now one of your spirit guides, and he takes the form of a bat. He helps you to sense energy. I felt extremely tired after that healing, and I slept very deeply for 12 hours, three days in a row. I noticed a change inside my heart as well. Instead of hesitancy and apprehension, I felt courage and confidence when I thought about teaching my apprentices, and I was able to move forward with it. It's fascinating to consider how complex our psyches really are, and how we can be deeply affected in this lifetime by experiences that actually predate our own birth. Fortunately, skilled healers like Laurel can liberate us to evolve beyond them. Since then, I have learned, for instance, about a lifetime in which I sacrificed my body to feed a hungry lion, as part of a spiritually guided initiation through dismemberment. A lifetime in which I was a child bride in Southeast Asia, a lifetime as a slave, one as someone's pet bird with clipped wings. Once I was an Andean tribe woman murdered by a spurned suitor who pushed me off the edge of a cliff during a tribal dance and made it look like an accident. In the Middle Ages, I was an herbalist who lived by herself in the forest most of the time, but occasionally donned armor to disguise herself as a man and then fought on horseback in battles. In the pioneer days, I died on the Oregon Trail. In another life in early America, I was a white woman who left her culture to go live with the Indians. Apparently, I have had many adventures. And this has been a preview of my new book, Trust the Flow, Awakening with Combo, Cannabis, and Ayahuasca. Trust the Flow is by myself, of course, Tara Rose, and it's available on Amazon. You can get it as an audiobook for Audible. You can get it on Kindle as an ebook, or you can get it in paperback form. Thank you so much for listening. And remember, if you'd like to connect with me, I would love to hear from you. You can follow me on Instagram at magic and flow and is spelled out a n d at magic and flow. Or you can go to my website and send me an email. And my website is magicandflow.com. I do have a very exciting announcement as well, which is that I have a brand new mentorship program for aspiring Reiki healers that's coming up. And you can be part of it if you're looking for a mentor and you're interested in getting yourself onto the healing path and learning the healing arts in a really comprehensive wonderful way. My program is called Ignite Your Light and it's going to start this winter. So feel free to get a hold of me and connect with me if you're interested. And as always, I'm wishing you a blessed day and a blessed life. Thanks so much for listening.